Churches are groups of people that come together to celebrate and emulate the person and work of Christ. And just like any other group, there's a lot of messiness that has to be waded through in order to find true connection. So in churches, when so much is on the line, how is it that it's so hard to figure out what Jesus means by love one another? Uh, well, today we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about connecting with the church. Hey guys, it's Eric with Afro-K again, and uh, we're continuing our series on connection. We talked last week about connection with the world. If you remember, we have to love the people of the world. And if we love the people of the world, then we'll hate the oppressive systems of the world that push those people down. Uh, this week, we're gonna narrow our focus. Last week is the world, real big, right? This week, we're gonna narrow it down, still big, slightly smaller, to the church. Um, and you may be surprised at how different the two connections really are. Um, one thing that they both have in common, for sure, is that you know, and all of our connections have this in common, really, as Christians, we should really know this, um, is that they start with love. Um, every connection we have, every connection starts with love. If it's godly, it starts with love. Broken connections are the ones that start with anything besides love. Uh, most people, uh, Christian or not, would agree that healthy relationships start with love. And or effects simile. So some people say they start with trust. Some people would say that they start with respect. And I would argue that those things are definitely facets of love, but it has to start with trust and respect and seeking the highest good for the other person, which is love. So they come under this umbrella, right? I, I will often talk about, and I'm not sure if I've done it on the station yet or if it's just kind of something I blab about in person, but the umbrella of love. Love is, is a complex thing. And, and I think it's important uh, if we're going to talk about love, to see it as this umbrella. Um, it's not a simple act to love someone. Uh, it's actually pretty messy. Um, if you love someone, you can have moments where you support them completely, right? You support what they're doing completely. Um, those are high five moments. Those are pat on the back moments. Those are the attaboy moments. Um, and the same umbrella of love can lead you to times where you may not support a person's actions, right? Those are like the call out moments or the tough love moments. We're gonna talk about tough love. Um, and then there's times under that same umbrella where you may actively be unsupportive of a person's actions. Uh, those are the life-saving moments, honestly. Those are the life-saving moments. When you are able to support a person but not support their actions, that's how we beat addiction. That's how we conquer, um, you know, like suicidal thoughts. And like, that's how we get through those things is when you stand up and you say, I am actively against your actions here. Um, let me say that again in a different way. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for a person is to be actively unsupporting of what they do. Um, that can be extremely life-giving. When we do it in the right way, that can be extremely life-giving. And it's really a huge part of our connection in the church. You're gonna hear that word again and again and again. Connection, connection, connection. Um, so my first point today, and this may come as like a bit of like a whoa moment for you, um, but just hear me out. My first point today is that Christians misdefine love, misdefine love. Um, we don't have a good definition for love a lot of times. Um, and, I mean, ouch, right? <laughs> That's not cool. Uh, <laughs> But it's funny because, I mean, not funny, it's really sad, if anything, but the, um, the one thing that Jesus says is going to identify us to the world as his followers is something that we are not good at on a base level. Um, to be fair, it's not something that Christians or, uh, excuse me, humans are born doing well. We are not born loving well. Um, we learn at a very young age how to take advantage of people, how to hurt people, how to lie. So we're not good at loving anyway, um, but connecting in a church means that you have this solid understanding of what love is. So Jesus says in John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So clearly connection in the church is extremely important. Love is going to show the world that we're Christ's disciples, but if we aren't careful with how we define love, then we're kind of showing the wrong thing, right? Uh, it's like wearing 
a shirt that you think is red and it's totally not red, it's like blue or something, like this red shirt that I'm wearing right now. Um, I wore a red shirt specifically today for this exact illustration. I hope that plays well. I don't know if it does or not. Uh, maybe we'll cut it out, I don't know, who cares? So how is it that we can take the one defining trait that Christ gave us and uh, treat it as though it's something for us to kind of throw around and, or make up as we go along? We, we do, I mean, we just kind of like make this love thing up as we go along. We define it however we want and then we play into it. Um, we shouldn't define love and then read it into the Bible. All right, we shouldn't define love and read it into the Bible. Just like we don't define God and then read him into the Bible, we don't define faith or goodness or morality and then read it into the Bible. That is called, big word alert, that's called eisegesis and it's a, an abuse of scripture. And even with our best intentions, we can abuse scripture. And so if we do that, if we take our definition of love and read it into the Bible, we can make, or, or anything, any read any definition to the Bible, when we take our point of view and force the Bible to fit it, we can make the Bible say anything. So to define love, really, you only have to look at what God has said and what he's done. And that starts with Jesus, right? Um, so Jesus is our most clear revelation of who God is and what God's done. So Jesus was love incarnate. God is love. Jesus is God. So yeah, right? So if Jesus was love incarnate, that means that every single interaction he had with people was love. Think about that. We like to take some of what the things, some of the things that Jesus did and say that, well, you know, this was love and this wasn't love. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Every interaction that Jesus had, because he was love incarnate, was loving. That's like taking a bottle of water and deciding that only some of it is wet. All of it is wet, because it's water, right? So in that same way, if we say that Jesus is entirely love, we have to say every part of him was loving, everything he did was loving, every interaction he had was loving. So neither side of this unbalance right? Because we have this unbalance. Neither side of this unbalance that Christians face um, would ever claim that Jesus was unloving, right? Would never say, well, Jesus was unloving. Um, but they're quick to just kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not going to read that one. Or mm, we'll just brush by that. Um, but, but really, that means that Jesus' interactions with those he healed, with those he forgave, with those he rebuked, all of them were equally loving. We're equally loving and that tells us something fundamental about love is that it sometimes is presented in different ways so it's still love but it's presented in different ways so that said there's some universal truths about love right first corinthians 13 love is patient love is kind it's like the most often read and equally often ignored passage about love it, it says this love is patient and kind love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude it doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance. A freaking man. That's amazing. So, um, but... <laughs> Already, though, I'm sure someone out there is going, yeah, see, so it says this. See, see what it says there? Stop taking your idea of love and reading it into this passage. Read it as if you've never thought about this subject before, and then form your opinion about love. That's how it works. That's how it actually works. So, um, Christians misdefine love. There's the tough love Christian, right? They see that love does not delight in evil, right? It, that, that they don't rejoice in injustice. Love doesn't rejoice in injustice, but rejoices in the truth. There's happy whenever the truth comes out, right? And then there's the mushy Christian, right? Tough love Christian, mushy Christian. Mushy Christian says that love is patient and kind and doesn't demand its own way. It's not pushy. You know, love is just, and it is, but where's the balance? Where's the balance? We can be tough love Christians and we can be mushy Christians and we have to be both. We have to have both. So wake up. Scripture says both. Jesus shows both. And according to John 13, 35, we owe, as Christians, as church members, right, we owe each other both in our context. As church 
people. We owe each other the mushy side and the tough love side. Uh, so that leads me to my next point. So one, Christians misdefine love. Two, we owe each other tough love. Oof. <laughs> That's kind of rough. I'm asking for it when I say that, right? Like I'm asking for it. Someday those words will be thrown in my face. And uh, yeah, great. Um, so we have to get a, to a place of connection, right? This whole thing's about connection. We have to get to a place of connection where we recognize how to love people in tough love, right? So first, truth can't just be a spear that we attack our brothers and sisters with. We can't just plunge truth into people in the name of love, right? Like that is, is just toxic for lack of a better word. And you know what? I, there, there is no better word. It's toxic. It's toxic when we do that. But at the same time, we need to get to a place in our connection where we can recognize that people love us enough to give us that tough love, to confront our sin, right? People love us enough to confront our sin. Um, and the New Testament's not at all silent about this. The New Testament says stuff about this. So first, 1 Corinthians 5.12. Last week, we read from 1 Corinthians 5 about how we're not meant to go out into the world and find godly people. And I used that to kind of illustrate the point that it's okay to accept everybody out in the world. But Paul narrows it down the same way that I'm narrowing it down. And if I'm being transparent, this series is sort of based on this concept that Paul has. So I'm narrowing it down and I'm going to say um, in the church, just like Paul says in the church here, he says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders outside of the church, right? To reiterate what we talked about last week. But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Ooh, tough love, man. Tough love. Uh, so that's what Paul has to say about it. Let's take a look at what Jesus has to say about it. So Matthew 18, 15. Jesus talks about how to deal with conflict. He says, if another believer, so once again, he's quantified this relationship, right? It's two believers or the church, right? If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Pretty wise words there. If the other person listens, listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then he or she won't accept the church's decision. If he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Every single one of Jesus' interactions and teachings and thoughts was love. This is somehow love. Doesn't make a lot of sense when you first think about it. Like, how is that loving to like treat this person as a pagan or a tax collector? Oof. So Paul, there's a theme here. They talk about this separation, right? Um, people who refuse to abandon their sin, they talk about the separation. Um, it's not punishment. Don't think of it as like being sentenced to prison or excommunicated, right? The church is big on like excommunicated. You're out. You're not part of the church anymore, right? This isn't that. This is where that's based, but the people who came up with that idea are stupid. Um, and, and if you're excommunicated from a church, P.S., whether it's literally you are excommunicated or it's metaphorically or allegorically or analogous that like you're excommunicated, you're blacklisted, whatever, by a church, that church is wrong. Just want to say it. Wrong. Um, so it's not a punishment. It's a quarantine. Don't think of it as a prison. Think of it as a hospital. Sin is pervasive. It's infectious. It is viral. It works its way in every place it can and degrades whatever it touches. To remove that person from the assembly is to seek healing for them. Jesus saying, treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. What he's saying is, first of all, remember how Jesus treated pagans and tax collectors very, very well. Matthew was a tax collector, he was his disciple. Zacchaeus, Jesus went and ate with him and invited him into the kingdom, right? So the pagan and the tax collector, think about how he treated the pagans, the Sumerians, right? The, uh, the Gentiles. So he treated them very, very well. And he's telling them, treat them very, very well to try to win them back. 
not to cast them out, but to heal them and win them back. Right? At the same time, Paul's saying something very, very similar as well. And we're going to get into it. Paul actually gives us more context in a little bit. So um, sin works its way in. Right? That's essentially what I'm saying. It's a quarantine because sin is infectious. But love doesn't let that happen. The love that we owe each other, this tough love, doesn't let that happen. Love doesn't let a person who is unrepentantly sinning damage other people. Love doesn't let that person be responsible for even more consequences, right? Paul's talking specifically about sexual sin. So if a person is indulging in sexual sin and they're bringing other people into it, now that sin is creeping into all those other lives. Love doesn't let that happen. Love doesn't let that happen. Gossip, slander, love doesn't let that happen. These sins that affect other people's lives, love doesn't let it happen. Love creates that space and that separation when necessary. Um, now, it should be said that if you're a Christian who prides themselves on their tough love, yeah, I'm kind of a tough love Christian. You're doing it wrong. If you think, I oh, am yeah, tough love Christian, I, I really give people the truth. No, man, you're doing it wrong. Do you recognize that love is patient and kind? Do you recognize that it isn't rude? Do you recognize that it endures all things? If tough love is your identity, then you're severely misunderstanding the biblical understand the biblical idea of love, Christ's teaching about love, the Christ-centered concept of love. You're missing the point. So to balance it out, point number three here: we owe each other partnership. Partnership. So tough love comes in, it does its thing. We owe each other partnership. We have to think of being Christians, and especially those of us that are Christian leaders, we have to think about this differently. There's so much pervasive sin in our churches that we clearly are not connecting the way that we're meant to be. We are not connecting right. Uh, our connections are broken. They're faulty. Uh, so you shouldn't have witch hunts. We shouldn't have crucifixions. You know, We shouldn't have uh, uh, these breakdowns in relationships where people feel like they're pushed out for whatever. We shouldn't have that. Um, instead, we should have partnerships that promote holiness. And Paul, and Paul describes that design in Galatians 6. So remember Paul saying, you know, if you're, if you're indulging in this unrepentant sin, you need to be separated from the church. Remember we talked about how that's rehabilitative. Well, now we're going to talk really about how that's rehabilitative right here. Galatians 6, he says in 6.1, says, Dear brothers and sisters, if Another believer is overcome by some sin. You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in that way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. And I love what he says here. You're not that important. <laughs> All right, Paul. Yeah, cool. I'm down with that. So that's Galatians 6, 1 through 3. And what he's saying, he's quantifying. He's quantifying what he said before. This passage represents the other side of tough love. Right? It, that, that piece that Jesus and Paul prescribed before this shows the other side. It shows that tough love is not a prison. It's a quarantine. It's a quarantine. And the point of creating that space is to preserve the holiness of those that are not yet affected by sin. Right? Think about it like a zombie movie, right? Come on, we've all seen them. Don't pretend like you're some holy person who's never seen a zombie movie or seen The Walking Dead or I don't I don't partake. Okay, well, you don't partake, but I think you know what a zombie is. Anyway, you get bitten, you're a zombie, right? The end. Um, so, and also, if you're not watching zombie stuff, at least watch something. I mean, they're not all great. In fact, uh, most of them are not great at all. But watch some. And it's a really good uh, picture of what sin is. Maybe I'll write that in a book someday. Anyway, so the point of creating that space is to preserve the holiness of those that are not yet infected, right? Uh, the other part is that um, it allows spiritually mature Christians to come in, those who are godly, Paul says, right? And partner with the person who's struggling. Partner with them and restore them. Paul says it happens through humility, it happens through empathy, and yeah, it happens through partnership. We share that burden. We share that burden. If you think you're too good to do that, 
You're not that great. That's what Paul says. You're not that great. You're not that important. <laughs> connection, it's love in balance. Um, just like connection with the world, connection in the church requires us to love each other. Jesus said, this is the advertisement of the church to the world. Just think about what the world sees though, right? Does the world see love as a church that's just lawlessly enabling sin, damaging lifestyles? Does the church see love that's just a savage indictment of other Christians by Christians who think too highly of themselves? Well, I hope not. I have a feeling that there's a lot of that going around and the world, I mean, for as dark as it is out there, think about it like a stage, right? The audience is dark. The stage is all lit up. Jesus says, you are the light. You're all lit up. And the church is on this stage and what the world sees should be John 13, 35, Christ's love for one another. But what the world actually sees is exactly what I just said, right? Savage indictments of one another or haphazard enablement, do whatever you want, right? Paul says we have to judge each other and love each other, separate from each other, bring each other back in. Jesus says we have to confront each other, partner up, make it work, but we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We either cut people out or we don't love them enough to confront their sin. Our love for one another is supposed to show the world what human connection was supposed to be. This is what human connection was meant to be. And there's so many ways to go wrong. If we stray too far toward love, or tough love, excuse me, if we stray too far toward tough love, we create this unhealthy, harsh connection. If we stray too far toward acceptance or affirming people in their sin, then we create meaningless and shallow connections. Our connection should be a partnership, right? In your church, it should be a partnership. Join together, arm in arm, and promote refinement, promote spiritual growth, promote repentant, repentance, and promote this closeness with God. That's how we connect in the church. We love each other enough to be tough when we need to be tough and to partner up. We are all in this together. We are all in this together. Let's fix what the church has broken over the centuries. Let's partner up with each other, love one another the way that Christ has called us to. And that's all I have for you this week. I'm really glad to be able to share this message with you. It is a place, of, it's coming from a place of love. It's coming from a place of experience. Um, yeah, I, I, this means a lot to me personally. And we wanna connect with you too. We don't wanna be your church. We don't want to be your church. Your church needs to be a special place that you have, that you go, or a group of people that you go to, not a place, a group of people that you go to, that you worship with, that you learn with, that you partner with. And we want to be part of that partnership in your life. We want to help you grow spiritually. We want to pray for you. We want to uh, build you up and strengthen you. And yeah, if you're struggling with something, reach out to us. Send us a message. Let us know how we can help. If you don't follow us on social media, make sure you do. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Hannah's putting out really great content every single day, encouraging content that's meant to build you up and help you connect with God in a greater way. We love you so very, very much, and we're looking forward to seeing you back here next week. Be blessed, guys.